let's talk about continuity. It's a bold strategy continuity. Let's see if it works out for him. Been waiting a while to unleash that gem. Dodgeball. Dodgeball. Good film. Great film. Simply put, before I even look at these crazy rules and that wacky picture there, continuity is the idea that if I were to draw a line or if I were to draw a curve, can I draw the whole thing without lifting up my pencil? So if, or in this case, stylus. So if I were to draw that as wacky as that looks, I drew the whole thing without lifting this off of my Chromebook. I mean a very expensive Alienware machine. Now this is continuous. Just look at it. You're, there's no breaks, no asymptotes of any kind. Is it the most pleasant looking picture? No, but it's still considered continuous. Now let's try to understand what I just drew out there and understand what I have here in these rules and then we'll take a look at that picture. First off, what A is saying is something is continuous is if or if I plug in an X value and I get an answer. Now this picture here is not the best example of that because for all of these I can plug in I can plug in one or is that one that's a half? I can plug in one and get one. Uh, I can plug in two and also get one. I can plug in negative two and get two. So um, this doesn't fall apart. However, if I were to give you a graph that looks like this. Uh, and I have a vertical asymptote along these lines, say that this is like zero. If I were to plug in zero, I'm not gonna get an answer. I, I get nothing. So in that case, uh, it stops being continuous if it breaks rule number one. Rule number two is if the limit doesn't exist. So I just erased a perfect example, but let's look at this picture here. If I were to graph, if I were to find out the limit as X approaches negative one from the left, okay, the limit as X approaches of uh, this picture right here, negative one from the left. Here I am coming from the left, going to negative one, going to negative one, going to negative one. I've made it. There's negative one. All right. The answer is negative one. Very good. How about going from the right? Going to negative one, going to negative one. Whoa, whoa, oh, there I am. As I go to negative one from the right, I hit one, which means the limit as X approaches negative one, period. Since the left was negative one and since the right was positive one, they don't match up. The limit does not exist. Okay. And if the limit does not exist, it's not continuous. So this is continuous at negative one. Now that's B. So if you have an instance like this, it no longer becomes continuous. And that's obvious. I mean, continuous means if start to finish, you have a curve, no breaks. Well, this obviously breaks. Now, some people might be looking, OK, well, what about negative two? I mean, that line is just going straight. You just have a hole there. Is it discontinuous there? Well, that's where C comes into play. If I were to find the limit as X approaches uh, negative two from the left, I get negative one. If I were to find the limit as X approaches negative two from the right, I also get negative one. So the limit as X approaches negative two does exist and it exists at negative one. However, if I asked you to find F of negative two, that means where exactly on my graph is my F of X value when I plug in negative two? Well, that answer is actually positive two. If I were to plug in negative two, plug in negative two, uh, I don't get that because that doesn't exist there. I get that. So the limit as X approaches negative two is negative one. F of negative two is two. They don't equal each other. So what this is basically telling us is if it's not it's not continuous if you have an asymptote or a break in the graph. It's not continuous if you have a break in the graph. And it's not continuous if you have a hole. So those are the three rules that um, a calculus book will tell you that we're going to have to keep in the back of our heads. But again, we're more concerned about if I were to draw a line as crazy as that line looks, can I draw it without lifting up my pencil? That's what continuous means. Vice President Mike Pencil. Well, 
former Vice President Mike Pencil. Former, okay. Okay, what I'm supposed to do here is I'm supposed to graph that wacky piecewise function. Uh, I took the liberty and did it already. But if you just want to see how you would type that out in your calculator, there you have it. Of course, I'm typing out the first part. Uh, there you go. Look at that angle. Um, okay, so this is just the top part of the piecewise function. I have an idea as to what's going to happen. I mean, at 3, on the bottom, you have x minus 3. So at 3, you're going to see an explosion. So let's see what that explosion looks like. Okay, so without being too picky, too specific, uh, it goes through three-ish, I don't know. The numbers aren't that important until I get to x equals three. So this is kind of what happens. At three, we have a vertical asymptote. It goes way down there and then comes back up. Okay, that's what we're looking at. That's what my graph looks like. That's this portion of the piecewise function. And the easy portion of the piecewise function is at x equals 3, we get 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So is it continuous? Well, looking at the picture, would I be able to draw that green and blue without lifting up my uh, pens? No. Even if I... Even if I use the same color, it would still be impossible. There's no way I can go down here and then like magically go up there and then back down. It's just not going to happen. So is this continuous when X is three? No, it's not. But the main reason is it violates the third rule that we had in the previous slide that said the limit as X approaches uh, three of F of X would be negative infinity because on the left side, I go to negative infinity. On the right side, I go to negative infinity, which means the limit as it goes to the regular number is negative infinity. However, it doesn't match up with f of uh, 3, which is 4. Those two aren't the same number. So this is discontinuous. Okay, again, it breaks that third rule that we saw on the previous slide. All right, <clears throat> now time to draw some graphs on our own accord. Before we do that, let's remind ourselves about um, what open and closed intervals look like. Um, if I were to give you something like this with the parentheses in it, that means if you have the parentheses and you're drawing a graph, this is not a coordinate, you're drawing an interval. So this is interval open three, open four you do not include those numbers on the graph. So if I were to graph this on a coordinate plane, here's three, here's four, I could grab just, you know, something like that. When you have the bracket looking uh, parentheses, the bracket looking interval, you do include those. So in the previous picture in the green, uh, I had those circles not filled in. Well, now you do fill in those circles. I don't care what happens in between. You do fill in those circles. So for these problems, for A, B, and C, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to recreate these. So what A is saying is draw a picture that's continuous, which means don't lift up your pen. Draw a picture that goes from negative 3 to positive 4. At negative three, don't fill in the circle. At four, fill in the circle. And whatever fun stuff you decide to do in between is up to you. Perfect. For B, you're never going to close uh, infinity because you can't. So I can just draw something like this, like a regular old parabola going to keep going to the left. It's going to keep going to the right forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. For C, uh, let's do blue. I don't really care about the left because I start at one. I'm going to close at one and I'm just going to go to the right. Okay.
Easy peasy. All right, so expanding information that I feel like we kind of already know and kind of feel comfortable about, uh, let's find out how and when um, a function becomes discontinuous. As you know, uh, whenever we have something that is undefined, whenever we have a function that becomes undefined, that seems to create some kind of explosion in the graph and usually gives us some kind of a horizontal, uh, vertical asymptote, not horizontal, vertical asymptote. We call the x value that makes uh, a function discontinuous, we call that a point of discontinuity, okay? Also known as a POD. Uh, not to be confused with the early 2000s new metal band that I used to love POD, uh, which is also uh, an extremely good band that I used to like. I'm not sure if I could, if their music holds up here in 2021 or whenever you're watching this video. Uh, but how do we do that? How do we find the x values that make the denominator zero? Well, right now I can't. However, I do remember a little something called the zero product property. And the zero product property says is if I have uh, two or more factors that multiply to each other and equal zero, I can reach inside. Like if I have something like this, x minus three, uh, x plus one, the numbers that are going to make this uh, whole thing zero are going to be the numbers that make each individual parentheses zero. So in this case, x equals three and x equals negative one. You know, if I were to plug in x equals three, that makes the first parentheses zero and then zero times who cares whatever this is a zero. If I plug in negative one, it makes the second parentheses zero. And so whatever this is times zero is zero. So we're going to do the same thing. We need to take that bottom equation and factor out care less about the top. I don't care about the numerator at all. We need to come up with two numbers that multiply out to four and add up to negative five. Well, if they multiply out to a positive and add up to a negative, they're going to be two negatives. So I'm going to have x minus something and x minus something. Those numbers that multiply out to four yet add up to negative five are going to be negative four, positive one. So what that means for us is our points of discontinuity, our POD, every day is a new day, it's a song from POD, are going to be from this guy, four, and from this guy, one. Some of you might be looking at, but what if we factor out the top? If we factor out the top, we're going to get four and negative four. Don't care. Don't care. I only care about the bottom, the denominator. So those are my points of discontinuity. Now, the intermediate value theorem is just a theorem that exists that might be helpful. But what the intermediate value theorem says is that if I, if I have a continuous function and I'm going to plug in a number between a and b, I'm going to get an f of x value that's going in between f of a and f of b. Kind of an obvious thing. It's just one of those theorems that we need to bring up so we can, so we're allowed to prove things further down the road. Okay, two problems and then we're done for this lesson. Uh, it's asking us here to find a value for k that will make the function continuous everywhere. What does that mean? Uh, what does that mean? Well, I have a piecewise function, and what we know generally from piecewise functions is piecewise functions tend to look something like this. I give you something like that, I have an open space, I give you something like that, and there's continuous or discontinuous stuff going on. There's a break here, they don't connect, I can't draw that picture without having to lift up my pen. How, though, can I create this exact same guy so that maybe I keep this one just like the way it is, but I bring that up and connect that to that? What do I do? Well, I need to find out how I can make these guys equal to each other when X is this number. Right now, I have something like, I don't know what K is, but if K was like eight, I would have something like this. 
what must I change K2 that will allow me to move that guy up and connect so that I have a continuous function? How do we do that? Well, we know that the action happens at four. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, let x equal whatever number this is, and then set the two equations equal to each other and find k. So let's do that. Uh, 2x minus 3 equals negative x plus k. All the magic happens when x is 4. Okay, so I'm going to replace x with 4. And now I find k. So this is an algebra 1 problem. I have 8 minus 3 equals negative 4 plus k. Combine the like terms on the left. Add 4 to both sides, and we'll find out that k is equal to 9. So k, when k is 9, if I were to draw this graph and draw that graph and let k equal 9, the two will connect. If k was anything else, they wouldn't connect. So now I have something that's continuous. Let's do it again, let's do it again, let's do it again, let's do it again. Let's let kx squared equal 2x plus k. The magic happens at 2. So I have 2 or k times 2 squared equals 2 times 2 plus k. Two squared is four, so I have four K equals four plus K. I have a K on the left side of the equal sign. I have a K on the right side of the equal sign. Let's subtract K from both sides. That gives me three K equals four. Let's divide both sides by 3, and k equals 4 thirds. So again, if I were to graph this equation and let y equals 4 thirds x squared, and let's let y equals 2x plus 4 thirds, at 2 these guys will connect. Okay. And that, ladies and germs, is that for section five. Okay, I hope you had fun. I know I did. I know I did. Okay, bye. <laughs>